Detective Carnby, how did you... Where did you go? I was just talking to Dr. Gray. You disappeared? No, it's not what you think. Have you... Have you found anything strange going on here? Yes. Everyone is being incredibly evasive and I can't figure out why. No, I mean something you can't explain. Paranormal, even. Detective, I really need you to get yourself together. I can't do this alone. Forget it. I'll figure it out. Do you want to come see Dr. Gray? No. I want to, I want to try something out. With this talisman, I think I can follow Jeremy to the place he mentioned in the book. What was the name? Do you remember something Spanish? T Tarawea. Yeah, that's where I need to go. Detective, are you going to be all right? Yeah, of course. Go talk to Dr. Gray. We'll rendezvous later. This talisman brought me back from the French Quarter in the blink of an eye. If Jeremy can travel so easily, then he could be hiding anywhere, even Teroea. If he can do it, so can I. I just need to figure out how the talisman works. There's no way I can get into this thing. Better leave it alone. There's no way I can get into this thing. Better leave it alone. Cassandra Beauregard, the beloved author. Very exciting, isn't it? What do you want to put down for a reason for admission? What her agent told us. Cassandra suffers from a writer's block and needs to finish her moving picture script before the end of June. Mr. Chardot suggests Cassandra's heavy use of barbiturates is holding her back and risks ruining her career. And how should we summarize her personal history? Let's keep it short. Cassandra Beauregard is a beloved crime author who managed to pull herself out of poverty and into stardom. Five years ago, she tried killing herself by jumping off a balcony. The incident left her a cripple and now relies heavily on her wheelchair. And for diagnostic impressions? Cassandra suffers chronic back pain following her suicide attempt. She self-administers morphine to keep herself ambulant, but has become addicted and the desired effect is now lost. The drug abuse clouds her mind, and she is unable to focus on real life. To save herself from this insight, she instead makes up stories to fill out the gaps in her own thought process, resembling the Korsakoff syndrome. Oh, bravo, Doctor. How will you treat her? First of all, she needs to be weaned from her drug addiction, and hopefully it will resolve her compulsive lying. Then look into permanently numbing her pain in her back through surgery. Finally, deal with her suicidal thoughts. Fantastic. With such a short time before June, I really hope she gets better soon. We will do what we can. Grace Saunders, 11 years old. Reason for admission? The mother insists on strict supervision by a proper gentleman to avoid further perversion of Grace's adolescence. Personal history? Grace's family possesses modest wealth and status. Her childhood seems ordinary, spending most of her time with private teachers and family friends. Grace's father recently passed away, leaving her mother the sole caregiver. And diagnostic impressions? 
Grace has trouble dealing with her father's death. She is willingly suppressing her feelings on the matter and isn't properly acknowledging the trauma she suffered. Any planned treatment? Grace needs nothing out of the ordinary. She simply needs parental guidance. Eventually, we can work on her feelings toward her father. Thank you, Doctor. I'll finish the paperwork and get her installed. Malcolm McCarthy, 54 years of age. Reason for admission? McCarthy admitted himself to Dossetto, stating simply that he needs some damn rest. And personal history? McCarthy claims he used to work as a lawyer in Baton Rouge, but says he can't go into details because of some legal dispute. His background remains largely a mystery, except for the occasional clue that he drops in conversation. Huh. And diagnostic impressions? McCarthy is an anxious man and an alcoholic. He often tells half-truths due to some deep-seated inability to trust other people. And how will you treat that? McCarthy will take some time to open up. Spending time with Jack's dog or the child should be good for him. Their harmless nature will help build his sense of trust. Elisabetta Perosi, 33 years old? What should I put down as reason for admission? Well, Perosi broke into Dossetto and was found wandering the grand parlor. She was confused and suffered partial amnesia. She insisted she belonged here and offered to pay for her stay. Right. What do you make of her story? Perosi claims to have been a member of the Astarte artist colony some twenty years ago. A claim that seems contrafactual due to her young age. She looks to be, and even thinks she is, 33 years of age. That would make her a child at the time. It seems fair to say that Perosi's story is untrue, deliberately so or not. Diagnostic impressions? Do you have anything? Perosi's story is peculiar, because she retracted her story about the artist colony. She no longer claims to be the same person as Elisabetta Perosi, However, my staff's research has confirmed there was a Perosi at that time who was in her early thirties. I suppose this case will take some time to investigate. How will you go about it? I wanted to contact the real Perosi, but it seems the whole colony disappeared one night. September 29th, 1915, during a hurricane. I will have to take it slow and figure out what this spell of impersonation could have been. Oh, I'm sure it will all clear up eventually. Thank you, Doctor. Um, Ruth Talon, 29 years of age. Reason for admission? Oh, Ruth's father wishes that his daughter be removed from New Orleans nightlife for the foreseeable future. He fears that her overly free spirit is tarnishing the family's reputation. Sounds simple enough. Personal history? Ruth comes from considerable wealth. Her family owns several hotels and restaurants. Unlike the rest of the family, her sense of adventure has taken her around the world, including France during the Great War as a photojournalist. The last decade, she has provoked many rumors of being a debauched flapper, bordering on nymphomania. And diagnostic impressions? Despite her father's frivolous reasons for her to be admitted, Ruth does seem to provide an interesting case. She is refreshingly open and doesn't shy away from talking about her life during the war or her continuous celebration after returning to the States. She is admittedly a sexual deviant and feels no remorse. And her treatment plan? Simply staying at Dossetto should do wonders for Ruth. If not, at least for her family's reputation. Ruth doesn't need to change, but with therapy I might be able to share with her some sympathy towards her family. I doubt she will settle down and become as dull as the rest of them, but at least she might try to be more discreet in the future. Looks like all the patients are accounted for, except for Jeremy.
Dr. Elmore Lee Gray is DeSetto's chief doctor. Accounting and all administrative work is handled by me, Paul Waits. Magdalena Thompson, or Mags, is responsible for the household. Jean-Baptiste and Charlotte Tabois are responsible for keeping the guests' medical regiments in check. Finally, Jack Chance is our gardener, who can occasionally be seen in the conservatory, but is, for the most part, busy outside. There are currently six guests at Dossetto. Malcolm McCarthy and Ruth Talant reside on the first floor. Jeremy Hartwood, Elisabetta Perosi, Grace Saunders, and, of course, Cassandra Beauregard live on the second floor. Paul, you're right about the plates on the boiler and the clock. They have been sabotaged, and I think I know who did it. They have something to do with Jeremy's episodes and how he seems to disappear at night. Right now, it's important that you keep an eye out for any of the pieces. I want to find out if I can repair the plates. Let me know if you find any of them. Lottie. Tell Lottie to take a look at the well in the kitchen garden. I saw you notice in the boiler room. You should know Mr. Chance won't be coming back. I got no business being in there myself, but you can take a valve from the wine cellar if you want to try to stop the steam pouring out. Be careful. Hmm. I need the key. This must be the clock that Jeremy wrote about in the commonplace book. I need the key. Huh. Looks like the plate that held the talisman in the seance room. But it's broken and missing some pieces. <laughs> yeah, uh, sorry, detective. Didn't mean to obstruct justice or anything. That's fine. You know, I'm kind of busy with my own case of a missing person. I, I was wondering if you've seen Grace, a girl about yay high. I can't say that I have. Why are you asking? Well, I'm looking for her. Is she in trouble? No, 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 no. Uh, she's just hiding somewhere. But we can't have a rascal like that running around unchecked at a time like this, you understand? Well, I haven't seen her. Well, yeah. let me know if you find her. I'll be around. Uh, I'll keep an eye out for your man, Jeremy. You scratch my back, detective. And I'll scratch yours.
Lost Plantations of Louisiana, Terry Bricklow, 1917. Their settlement was a small plantation on the eastern shore of Lake Pontchartrain. The land was considered difficult for industry and was sold for only $30 to Elia Pickford in 1818. Pickford employed hundreds of workers from nearby New Orleans to clear the woods and build a small plantation mansion facing the lake with a striking Greek Revival temple facade. Tessato kept a modest production of Paris tobacco and indigo that persisted up till the Civil War. During the antebellum era, Tessato was the source of many rumors concerning voodoo and witchcraft. People who traveled the lake reported seeing people dance at night in front of bonfires, bleating and wailing. On June 17, 1862, Captain J.W. Norton of the Union Army recounts leading a raiding party from ships anchored in Lake Pontchartrain in order to seize control of Desetto and free the slaves working there. The captain was surprised to find the workers fighting back with unprecedented zeal. Norton's account describes these men and women as enraged with fanaticism. Pickford reportedly tried to placate the raiders, but was shot in the confusion. Captain Norton left the mansion burning and retreated to his ships with his men. Their settle was left in ruins for several decades. The ownership of the land was long disputed and returned to the Ledoux family in 1901. Several police reports were filed during the following years as the Ledoux tried to get rid of a camp of squatters on their land. The police made several visits to remove the trespassers, but the people kept returning. On November 1, 1907, Inspector Legras of the police charged a deadly attack in order to save several children kidnapped by the squatters. Many were killed, and even more were jailed. The following year, Ledoux rebuilt their settle, incorporating the surviving stone foundation and adding a magnificent wrought iron conservatory. The farmland had been reclaimed by the surrounding woods, so it was no longer profitable to use as a plantation. Instead, the house was turned into an artist's colony. The Astarte Artist Colony was a successful group of artists, including figures such as painter Heinrich Cassel and poet Nora Keith. The group was also known for their beloved Mardi Gras crew called the Pirates of Pontchartrain. On September 29, 1915, a tropical hurricane tore through Louisiana, causing Lake Pontchartrain to flood New Orleans. Due to the remote location of their settle, it took almost two weeks for outsiders to learn that the artist's colony was abandoned. The twelve residing artists had all vanished without a trace. The empty mansion of their settle still stands on the shore of Lake Pontchartrain, with much of its temple facade intact. The Ledoux family currently has no intention of repairing the house. Went shot. No! What happened? Everything's normal again? All right. 